Thank you for coming to the talk. Uh, my name is Caroline Freeman, and this is my colleague Rich Calcutt. Hello. And we're going to be talking today about learning design for the mobile learner. Firstly, um, this talk was billed uh, to have our uh, head of learning design, um, James Corrie Wright. I know some of you will want to have seen him. Unfortunately, he's ill, so I'm standing in. Half the man, but um, I hope you'll enjoy it anyway. So, whoop. But today, we'd like to share with you uh, the Brightwave philosophy and approach to mobile learning. Um, we're going to argue that uh, effective design for mobile needs to take into account the way that we're all using the devices anyway, and that the design solutions that you come up with can compri comprise a surprisingly retro approach, as well as some distinctly uh, new approaches. So let's start by defining what we mean by mobile. Now obviously, as a learning provider, we're asked to provide solutions that work across things that everyone thinks of as mobile, laptops, tablets, phones. But that we all know that those, that those devices, they, we work on them in very different ways. And we feel about them in very different ways. Clark Quinn um, has uh, drawn a distinction between laptops and tablets and phones through the amount of battery power. Basically, a truly mobile device is one that you have with you all day long that works quite happily um, next to you as you're working and doesn't need to be plugged in all the time. So laptop feels very different because of that. Then there's a kind of emotional difference as well. If something goes wrong with my laptop, I have a productivity issue. If I lose or break my phone, I feel lost. And I feel truly kind of personally disconnected from a social world. Now, our argument is that if we're going to design truly effective solutions uh, for these devices, we need to take into account those differences and not just ignore them. So how's mobile learning affecting workplace learning at the moment? Uh, the latest Brandon Hall uh, survey on mobile learning showed that all the top performing companies are using mobile learning. And these are some of the figures on how they rated the effectiveness of the various forms of mobile learning. Interestingly, those that are using more, have been using mobile learning the longest, rate it as most effective, clearly showing that there are better ways of using it, and the more you use it, you know, hopefully, the better um, you'll become. But let's look at the, um, what kinds of, of learning is, are being provided over those mobile uh, devices. And if you look at the length of each of those items, they're still quite long. Let's just take that mobile video, 9.5 minutes. Average time, uh, someone in the US spends watching video on their phone, five minutes the whole day. So clearly that video is twice as long as you would normally expect to be looking at the video on your phone all day long. And um, those kind of statistics really suggest that there's legacy content that's just being ported and dumped in a mobile environment. And we're still using the same old constructs and assumptions that, that e-learning has always had and has delivered to a desktop. Now, like other e-learning providers, Brightwave has a responsive engine that allows us to provide content across, um, one type of content across uh, all devices. And a, a, a lot of you will, will know what that is. It will resize the content. It will show different sorts of content depending on the device. For this kind of design, it, what, what we'd say is that this uh, responsive web design has become an approach when it should be a tool within an approach. So it's not the approach as per se. And to imagine that you can just create one entity that can work uh, across all devices in all cases is really to undermine a, you know, a, a, to, to undermine a kind of design approach where you should be looking at the way these things are being used. Outside the work environment, we're all using these devices quite differently. So when I'm at a football match, 
I'm looking at the scores that are of other matches on my phone. When I go home, I might on the tablet be looking at the highlights from the game. When I'm at work in the lunch town, I will be watching, um, I'll be looking up the statistics and the league tables perhaps on my PC. They're all really different ways. Uh, it's the same subject matter, my football team, but I'm enhancing my enjoyment and knowledge of it in different ways. So rather than just simply imposing a kind of web-based responsive design model, we believe we should be um, delivering a radically responsive solution. That's one that doesn't just change the visual layout of the content, but accepts that the devices have different characteristics. So it's not one that just remashes conventional content, delivers it across all those devices, but actually uses our experience of living in a mobile world to fundamentally question what that learning should look like. The, the classic e-learning module is comprised of a, a mixture of activities, sometimes even on the same screen. If we could deconstruct those activities and think about different platforms, we can look at them differently. So, for example, with the increasing size of phone screens and the development of phone apps, uh, e-reader phone apps, more and more people are reading more and more on the phone. In fact, last year, the most popular way of reading an e-book was not the Kindle, it was a mobile phone. So you need to be questioning your own assumptions when you're coming to this and actually looking at how people are using uh, the, the technology. Podcasts are being used really effectively on phones in the developing world to deliver learning, but they're totally neglected in Europe and the US. Watching video, it might be short and snappy, but it is increasing um, across all mobile. Pushing and pulling is a un, a kind of un, underexploited uh, to date. Is there anyone who really truly believes that uh, a one-off uh, information security course is going to change behavior? Interact, now, that's a def defining element of traditional e-learning. But let's think about what that means, that interaction. At the moment, too often, it's just a top-down, simplified, limited, drag and drop. And that's the interactivity. And the mobile um, environment gives learning design a whole new set of tools, which um, Rich will look at later, and that could, where you can create really genuine user interaction, which will question that top-down model. So perhaps at this model, uh, at this point, we'll just look at uh, one of those, which is um, interactive video. Interactive video, again, something that has its roots way back in Laserdisc technology and gaming. And it's perhaps a real area of opportunity as video becomes more prominent on all mobile devices. An interactive video uh, course called Lifesaver, which some of you will see, scooped up lots of awards in the e-learning awards last year. Fantastic course, support, supported by the, sponsored by the uh, Resuscitation Council put you in, right in the middle of a scenario uh, of an emergency where you had to make decisions and you had uh, the, the impact of those decisions, decisions was shown to you. Now brilliant as that is, obviously, not every interactive video can be as complex or cinematic as Lifesaver, but you can create interactive video which is just a conversation between two people, say like in a sales uh, situation. So, the moral of the story so far, before I hand on to the next generation, is that we should be using radically responsive design. We should be listening to the audience, seeing how they're using the technology, and don't imagine that one size can fit all every time. And don't overlook the familiar. So, straightforward reading, watching and listening, but make them mobile appropriate. Interactivity is more than a screen type, it challenges fundamentally the way that we've been uh, providing top-down learning. So now I'm going to hand over to Rich, who's going to look at some more of the specificities of uh, mobile environment and see how it's going to impact learning design now and in the very immediate future. All right. Um, first of all, thanks very much, Caroline. She picked this up really late in the day yesterday, so uh, thanks. that was really, really good. Um, given that Caroline's talked about the virtues of uh, video for learning, Let's start off with a little video. This is uh, Steve Jobs introducing the new iPhone in 2006. Um, 
the wrist is supposed to be sound. Uh, there's no sound on this one. Basically, what he's doing is he's doing the slide to unlock thing. He's telling people this is the... There we go, right there. And to unlock the phone, I just take my finger and slide it across. All right, you want to see that again? Go to sleep. We wanted something that you couldn't do by accident in your pocket. Just slide it across. Boom. And this is the home screen of iPhone. So the reaction to just that really simple gesture of sliding to unlock, I think, is really amazing. In 2006, we'd never seen anything like that before. And I decided to call this slide to unlock because I think this is a really great example of where the things that we do in the mobile environment really translate and become tacit in what we do every single day in our everyday lives. And uh, like I said, in 2006, nobody had done slide to unlock before. None of us had ever done sliding to unlock a mobile device. But now it is something that's so ingrained in our everyday lives. If anyone has an iOS device, and I'm willing to bet probably at least half the people here do, it's something that you do dozens of times a day. You don't think about it at all. It's become completely ingrained. It's second nature. And if, any, if at any point in the next 15 minutes or so when I'm talking, you think uh, that will never catch on, people will never do that, think about slide to unlock. Think about how six years ago, Nobody was doing it, and now it's just so tacit, it's so ingrained. And in one year's time, two years' time, five years' time, imagine what you might be doing then that's second nature. So I want to talk about three things that are really inherent to the great mobile experiences that we have every day. Uh, this isn't an exhaustive list, but I think it's things that really apply uniquely to mobile. The first thing is pushing and pulling. And uh, pushing is when a content vendor sends content at their discretion to a content consumer. And pulling is when a content consumer asks a content vendor for content. And the key thing here is that discretionary part. So pushing the discretion is with the vendor, and pulling the discretion is with the user. And I think we really have to think about content in these basic kind of economic terms of supply and demand. Content is only really valuable if it's relevant to me in a given time and place. Being relevant in a time and place gives content meaning. And if content isn't meaningful to me, I'm not going to act on it. And the thing with mobile technology is that it's increasingly easy to know when something's going to be relevant to somebody. With mobile technology, you know where somebody is, you know when they are in that place, you know what they're doing. It's increasingly easy to tell those things. And it's also increasingly easy for users who want to pull information to say, I want content now. Please give it to me. So increasingly, I say there's no reason to be irrelevant. It's, in, it's, it's unacceptable to be irrelevant with mobile technology. A really good example of pushing content um, that's really relevant to people is this app called Banjo. And uh, Banjo pushes content such as um, events, um, people that are nearby, uh, things like deals and stuff like that. It works on three levels, basically. It pushes and makes things relevant on three different levels. The first level is on geolocation. So it knows where you are. It knows when you're in a certain place. It sends stuff to you that's relevant to your physical location. The other way it works is with uh, your usage of the app. So if you're constantly reading news articles about uh, arts and culture, it sends you more of that stuff. If you're constantly reading stuff about uh, sports, it sends you more of that stuff. The third way it works is with your likes from things like Facebook and your other social networks. The more stuff it knows that you like, the more it will send you relevant content. And again, relevant, meaningful, having value, content having value. You'll hear me say this a lot over the next few minutes. In terms of pulling, a really great example of this is the App Store. And the thing with the App Store is that it really acknowledges this content lifecycle of downloading, using, and then disposing. I think we have to start conceptualizing content in terms of being disposable. Like everything else, you know, things are increasingly disposable. So if I'm out and about and I hear a song and I want to know what it is, I have a need. So I download something like Shazam. Shazam tells me what the song is. And then I'm probably not going to use Shazam again anytime soon. So I'll just delete it. Because in a world of bring your own device, if you as a content vendor are telling a user to store things, store things on your device, that's taking up space that I could use for a photo album, for a record, or something like that. So I think as learning designers, we need to think that content is disposable. And we don't need to get hung up on the fact that people will ditch it when it's not relevant anymore. So I guess what I'm saying is that 
as a content vendor, we need to make sure that the stuff we're giving to people, all the stuff we're giving to users is sharp and focused like an app. And we need to make sure that our LMS is more like the App Store. It's something that people can say, I have a need, and then download what they want. So if you're going to push something, you really need to make it relevant and let people find what they need in an instant. The second main thing I want to talk about is recording and sharing. And the thing with PCs is that they don't really follow us into this arena of practice. We're not really learning when we're at our desks using PCs, tapping away, sending emails. We're learning when we're with people, when we're sharing stories, when we're sharing experiences, sharing practices. And our mobiles follow us into that arena of practice. They are at our side when we're doing things, when we're doing our learning. And in order to kind of really make sense of that and, and to acknowledge that, you have to think that tracking isn't about passing or failing a quiz anymore. It's not about uh, completing or not completing a given e-learning module. We need to allow people to track and record what they want to record, what's meaningful to them. We have to take from the learners what they find meaningful and allow them to track on that basis. And that is the foundation of Tin Can API for e-learning. And people will do this. If you give them the opportunity and you really open the door to let people share what they want to share and record what they want to record, people will do it. Because feedback is a very validating thing. We use feedback for security. And it's also part of the sense-making process. We learn whilst getting feedback. Feedback is really important to the learning process. And uh, tracking is, like I said, more, of a, more than a quiz score. And um, I'll share something with you now. Um, Maybe a year, two years ago, I was really, I would not be here. I was so, so nervous about doing presentations. And uh, I made, I used to make really horrible slides, really wordy slides and things like that. But I've gone on, well, I don't know if I'm a better presenter, but I'm certainly less nervous about it. So if I want to share this with somebody and I want to tell people about you know, how well I think I've done in terms of improving my presentation skills, what do I want to do? I don't want to send them uh, a list of all the learning courses I've done. I'm not going to tell them about that I got 100% on a quiz. What I'm going to do is tell people about the fact that I'm here right now doing this, doing this talk. And I think a really good way of doing that is with a mobile device. So I'm going to do it right now, actually. Um, I'm just going to take a little selfie. So I'm going to try and get a few of you in it. So if everyone could give me a bit of a smile, I'll get as many of you in it as I can. So there we go. That's going to be on my learning records later on. Um, I'll upload it to Tesla, Brightwave's learning management system, social learning platform, whatever it is. Um, that's going to be part of my learning records. I'm going to show that to my manager. I'm going to show that to my learning group. So much more meaningful than saying, I passed a quiz. In terms of tracking, what people like to track, increasingly fashionable is things like health tracking. So this is a, a Nike fuel band. It lives on your wrist. It syncs up blue, uh, via Bluetooth to your phone via an app. And uh, users record activity. They track and share their progress. And it does it all without interrupting their normal everyday practices. So it's on the wrist. It's connected to the phone. It just frees, you up, frees your hands up and lets you do what you would otherwise be doing, even if it wasn't there. Another really incredible um, example of people recording and sharing stuff, um, and I'm not going to dwell too long on this, because I know everyone will know about this and use it frequently, I'm sure, is, is Pooplog. Um, I think this is absolutely incredible. Um, obviously, it kind of does what it says on the tin. Um, you can measure, you can record things like uh, quantity, type, texture, things like that. I think the really incredible thing, though, is this reporting. You can share a report on Facebook, on Twitter, with your social networks and things like that. Um, quite incredible. If you ever doubt that people like to share and like getting feedback about stuff that's meaningful to them, just remember Pooplog. So like I was saying, um, mobile devices, the things we have to think about, um, there's a whole load of ways that we can track and we can share. Things like GPS, photos, videos, voice recording, Foursquare users will know about checking in, all these ways that we can record what we're doing. But on the other side of the sharing equation is the people with whom I'm sharing stuff. I don't want to share stuff that's really boring. Uh, I want to share stuff that people find interesting and other people can make sense of. So if I say to you that you know, this morning before I came into the talk, I was out mountain biking, you know, even that sounds even boring to me. Um, so I don't want to just tell people that I'm doing it. I want to show them what I'm doing. So if I show you this, 
That's that's me on my bike. It's a pretty good backflip. I've done better, um, but that's what I did this morning. Showing people is much more interesting, much more engaging for the people with whom you're sharing than just telling people. And so this is a, a quote from GoPro. These guys are pioneers in terms of wearable cameras, point of view cameras. Capture and share your world, dream it, do it, and capture it. Your GoPro cameras make it easy to document and share your life's most interesting experiences. Documenting and sharing is the world we live in. People love to document and share what they're doing. So allow them to do that with mobile devices. And uh, I'll just touch quickly on this. If you look at social networks and you look at the patterns of people sharing, you, what you notice is that the volume that people share is decreasing, but the frequency and the depth that they're sharing at is increasing. So with Facebook, you know, we've all got the kind of friends that um, will upload 300 photos after a night out or something like that and tag you in 100 of them. A massive volume of, of stuff is shared, you know, paragraphs and paragraphs of text, more, more than you could even want to get through. With Twitter, Twitter really narrowed it down and said, OK, 140 characters is all you've got. One photo, one video, one link at one time. And the amount that people shared actually, I think, increased because the frequency with which they were sharing drastically increased. Things like Instagram uh, flipped the whole thing on its head and it made, it, made the focus more about um, uh, images, more, uh, more about images and less about the text. And then with Snapchat, um, I don't know if you know about Snapchat. I think it's a phenomenally interesting thing. Um, Aside from all the critiques of Snapchat and the kind of behavior possibly it encourages, the thing with it is you share a photo with a friend for a certain period of time, between two and 10 seconds. And after that, it's gone from their device, it's gone from the Snapchat servers, it's gone forever, unless somebody's taken a screenshot of it. But I think the thing that's interesting about this is that sharing is getting more spontaneous. Because of the frequency with which people are sharing is increasing, we're doing things more in the moment. And I think that makes it more meaningful. It makes it more authentic and genuine. And that is the stuff that's really interesting to me. That's the kind of sharing that I think people want to do. The final thing I want to talk about is keeping it real. And we really need to do this. We need to think about this a lot for mobile. Um, the very common critique about mobile is that uh, it, mobile devices are making us disconnected from people around us and the world around us, uh, that we're dependent on them for security, validation. Uh, We've all maybe been there or seen people with a nervous tick with their mobile phones where maybe they're out in public for 30 seconds without, being, you know, without having a conversation with somebody. The nervous tick, get your phone out, answer an imaginary text message, or check Facebook or something like that. A really good example of this uh, is this photo. I love this photo. This is um, from the, uh, the introduction of the new pope in 2013. The sea of light is people using their mobile devices to capture this moment. If you compare it to 2005 with the previous pope, it's just dark, absolute darkness. It was before the mobile revolution. It was before people used screens to uh, mediate their experience in the world. So I guess the argument is that people are increasingly connected with mobile devices to each other, to their social networks, to the web, but they're less connected possibly to the moment. And so I say we want to avoid this thing called second life syndrome. What we can't have is a generation of learners who can get a high score when they're evacuating a virtual burning building in a game, but who would burn to death while they're tweeting about it in real life. So I think we need to push the boundaries of what we think of as being mobile. It's not just about a phone. It's not just about a tablet. What's the mobile learning or the mobile philosophy? And I think it is access to, access to what we want when we want it. I think it's about having mobile devices and mobile experiences that don't divorce us from the real world. And I think it's about relevant sharing and recording. And a really good example of this is Google Glass. Um, there have been other people uh, learning tech uh, yesterday. Um, I think Brian Solis talked about uh, Google Glass. So I won't develop it for too long. but. Google Glass is not sci-fi. It really is happening. It's going to be in production. It's going to be available to consumers very soon. It's built around sharing. And everything that Google Glass does enables you to share what you're doing in a moment in your point of view. And it decreases the amount of time between needing content and getting content. It decreases the amount of time between recording what you're doing, doing something, and sharing it. And it removes, I think the really important thing is it removes 
the barriers to practice. It allows us to live our real lives without this mediation of a mobile device. We don't have to look down. We don't have to hold things in our hands. It just lets us do what we would otherwise be doing, even if the technology wasn't there. And the best mobile technology is stuff that is invisible. And with all this kind of stuff, we really need to avoid uh, thinking in any way about um, putting normal e-learning courses and normal e-learning content, for example, onto things like Google Glass. This is a completely new paradigm. It's more around sharing. It's more around um, tracking and recording. And uh, in case you didn't know, 2014 is a big year for wearable technology. So Intel at, their, uh, at CES recently, they unveiled uh, their new technology, Edison, which is a dual-core PC with onboard Wi-Fi, onboard Bluetooth, size of a thumbnail. They uh, released a prize fund for any developers that can use Edison in consumer-focused wearable technology. So 2014 very much is going to be the year of development for, for wearables. And this, to me, is the new generation of mobile technology. I think phones, tablets, mobile technology, it's not going to go away, but it's increasingly old school, I think. Wearable technology is going to be the future. So uh, to summarize those three points, if you're going to push content, make it meaningful and allow people to get stuff from you, allow people to request content that they find meaningful. Sharing is really good. Let people share what's meaningful to them. And don't allow what you're asking people to do on their mobile devices to detract what they would, from what they would otherwise be doing in real life. And I'll leave you with this quote. Um, this is uh, from a guy from Wired, Matt Honan, who was, who's lived with Glass for about a year now. So the future is on its way, and it's going to be on your face. And uh, we need to think about it and be ready for it in a way that we went with smartphones. And as we all probably know, the, uh, the learning industry was not ready for smartphones, and arguably we're still not doing it very well. And while we might make fun of these glass holes today, come tomorrow, we will be right there with them. Wearables is where it's going, so please, let's be ready for it. So if you have any questions, uh, certainly we will answer them now. Otherwise, please come and see us on stand 116. Uh, Dr. Digitalis is uh, James Corey Wright, head of learning design's uh, Twitter handle. Um, I'm much more boringly just eLearnerRich. Uh, please follow us. Please ask us any questions. And uh, thanks very much.